Welcome to Udacity's Ask a Career Coach. My name is Martin McGovern, and we are just going to take a couple of minutes right now to allow people to filter in, join the live chat. So if you are here, please post your location and um, what you're working on right now, uh, what your job title is or dream job title is in the chat. Uh, we've got Rui there. She's going to be collecting questions throughout the conversation today, and we're going to be answering all of your questions, or at least as many as we can, in the next hour. So bear, uh, hold hold with me as we give a few minutes for folks to join the, the webinar, and we will jump on in. Thank you so much for joining today's Ask a Career Coach on YouTube Live. I'm excited to get into it. All right, we got people coming in. We got San Francisco, San Jose. We've got India currently ending the uh, data science nano degree. Welcome. Washington, DC, San Francisco, that's us. <laughs> I'm actually in Chicago. So if there's any Chicagoans out there, uh, we got a nice like chilly day out here today. Eh? We got India. It's 1.30 in the morning in India. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for staying up or waking up and joining us. Uh, that is some serious dedication. Super happy to have you here. All right, we got some questions coming in. Thank you, Heggy. We're going to be collecting these questions and going through them throughout the uh, presentation here. The one that we're going to kick off with is around behavioral interviews. We posted a video today with the Udacity, uh, Udacity career tips. Um, we talked about the behavioral interview and the three questions you can likely get. So we're going to kick off this conversation in about three minutes talking about that. So any questions you have around behavioral interviews or interviews in general, uh, please put them in the chat and that will be the main part of the discussion or at least the initial part of our discussion today before we jump into all the topics that are on your minds. All right. It's foggy on the bridge. Maybe that folk, maybe, uh, maybe you're in Chicago too. Yeah, I could see some fog out there. Beautiful Seattle, dream job would be a product manager. Awesome. Machine learning. All right, we got some questions about experience. Um, Pedro, your question, if you could provide a little bit more context around what you mean by no experience. Have you ever worked any jobs, internships, anything all the way back to, you know, my first job was mowing lawn when I was in a teenager. Um, it, put a little more context in and we'll definitely get to your question. All right, thank you, Heggy. These are great questions, keep them coming. And we're just gonna hold and wait for a few more folks to join the chat. All right, Nathaniel, thank you for sharing your question. Keep the questions coming, everyone. This is going to be exciting. We got a lot of stuff to talk about today. All right, we're going to start getting into it. Now we're about five minutes into the call. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, please put your name, your location, and your career question in the chat. Rui's going to be collecting our questions throughout the presentation today, uh, or at least throughout the conversation today. 
and uh, we will be diving in. Our main topic is around behavioral interviews, but feel free to ask questions about anything related to the job search and what you're currently working on. Really excited to jump in. Thank you again for joining us today from all over the country, all over the world. It's gonna be a good combo. All right, so the first thing that we wanna chat about today we posted a video in the Udacity Career Tips video series. I believe it's video 16. Um, and in that video, we talked about the behavioral interview. And the number one thing that I see happening in a behavioral interview is that people tend to be very vague with their answers. We wish we could just say, I need a job. I need to pay rent. Please hire me. Like that would be, that would be the thing we wish we could say. Uh, because it is honest, but it's a little too honest and it's actually not really what you're there for. What you're there for isn't for them to give you money, although that's part of the transaction. What you're there for is to provide value. What you do, what your skill set is, solves problems for an employer. So when you're talking to them during an interview situation, if you're not addressing how you solve problems, you're completely missing the mark as to what they're trying to figure out about you. So for instance, a lot of people will get questions around, you know, what's the time that you struggled with a coworker? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Tell me about yourself. And we give very general answers that never tie back to the role that you're trying to get, that never tie back to the thing you're trying to do, the problem you're trying to solve. So what you wanna do when you're thinking about answering questions during a behavioral interview is always tie it to specific examples, to specific examples of what you've done in the past and what you can do in the future. So for instance, what's a time that you've struggled with a coworker? Most people say, well, this one time uh, I was working on a project. They don't specify what the project is. They don't specify what the goals of the project were. They don't even specify um, what the problem was that came up that the project was built in to solve. And so then the person who's listening to you never gets a really clear sense of what you're working on. Just this general abstract idea of a project. And then they go on to say, and I, you know, I had a coworker who I, you know, didn't quite see eye to eye with. Now you never said the person's name. You never said anything about them. It's like watching a movie and never getting to see the character on screen. How are you ever going to relate to the story if you can't put an image in your head? So you need to give a name or you need to give some sort of descriptor of the person, maybe, you know, the developer or whatever the thing is that you want to use to describe that person. Then you need to explain what the goal is that you were trying to get to and why this interaction that was a struggle was hindering your progress toward that goal. So I was, you know, we started, we kicked off this project, we're working towards it. And then Sally, Sally, you know, she and I just couldn't see eye to eye, something happened, right? And you specifically detail out the, the issue that happened. Uh, a specific example, not just we struggled, because again, I can't picture that. You need to actually say what you struggled with. So you and Sally are struggling, right? Um, but you have to figure it out. You have to come to some sort of conclusion. Maybe you tried a couple things, uh, set up a one-on-one, -on -one, did some different things. Uh, did it work? Did it not work? What were the solutions that you attempted to implement in order to continue working towards this goal that you and Sally both have together? And then you need to explain the outcome. This is the hero's journey, rising action, conflict, climax, and resolution. You need to bring it back to a resolution. The resolution is that the project continued to move forward and had good results. And what you can say is, I learned how to have interpersonal uh, you know, conflict and conversations and still stay on target, which is something that I can do in future projects when I'm working with your team. Boom, now you've got a story arc that ties back to what you're here to talk about, which is this job. And the same goes with strengths and weaknesses and tell me about yourself. Just talking about myself, if I said, you know, I really love to go to the movies, what does that have to do with my job? What does that have to do with the problems that I solve for my employer? Sure, I'm really into Marvel movies, but what does that matter to them, right? We need to be talking about things that matter to the employer. And you have to realize at the end of the day, when you're in a behavioral interview, it's not really about you. It's about how you can help them with the problems that they have in their company. 
So it's a definite shift in mindset. Let's say you're a front end developer, right? Maybe user experience or beautiful design or whatever the thing is that you value most about your work saying I can bring that in and re and you know refresh the website or create a simpler experience that enables people to purchase more. You can create these ties from the work you do to the problems and needs that they have in the business and the baseline business goals. So there's a lot of things that we can do in a behavioral interview, but the main thing you wanna do is give specific examples and then tie it to the problem at hand that you can help solve. So. As we go into this idea, this, this discussion about, um, about the behavioral interview, we've already got a few questions uh, coming in about additional things that we'd like to dive into. So please, if you have any other behavioral interview questions, put them in the chat and Rui will be sending them my way so that we can get into it all today. Super excited to jump in. And again, if you have any other career questions, please add them as well. All right. All right, our first question. We've got a number of questions from Heggy. Thank you so much, Heggy, for joining us again this week. Um, your first question is, how can I show my passion during an interview? This is a really interesting question because it starts much further before the interview. Um, if you wait until you're in an interview and you realize you're at a company that you don't really care about, it's going to be hard to fake your interest. And I know passion is a very overused word right now, but the key thing here is interest. Interest not only in the topic at hand, but in the problems that need to be solved in order to uh, move that industry forward. So let's say you know, you're searching for a job, you don't know what you wanna do, you have an idea of the job title, and you're just applying to everything. One day you have an interview with a shoe company, the next day you have an interview with a bread company, and the day after that you have an interview with someone who's, I don't know, selling other widgets. How are you going to be, in your head, passionate about all those things? You're probably not. You know, if you are talking to a credit card company and you have zero interest in credit cards or knowledge of the credit card industry, it's going to be a tougher conversation than if you are obsessed with video games and you're talking to a video game developer. So you, I would say the first thing you need to do in order to show your passion during an interview is get interviews at companies that you have an interest in. The way you do that is you write down your favorite hobbies. Um, I know a lot of people I talk to, it's usually something in the recreation space. I like to hike, I like to canoe, I like to cook. So the cooking space is a big one. Um, I'm really into reading audiobooks and the, and the publishing industry. I'm really into um, education and the education industry, finance and the financial industry. Um, there's all sorts of industries and you can look on LinkedIn for all the different types of industry codes. So when you're doing your job search, I would focus on let's say the top five industries that you're most interested in. So that when you get to the interview, you don't have to do anything other than be interested the way that you already are. So if someone were to ask me a question about education, I clearly could talk for a long time about it. Um, but if someone were to ask me a question about sports, oh man, that'd be a really rough one. Uh, if I ever had, a, had an interview at, I don't know, the Sox here in Chicago for a marketing position, They'd be like, well, what are your thoughts about marketing in the sports industry? And I would just be, you know, it, it would be a lot of faking it, right? It would be a lot of, uh, yeah, no, I totally went to Sox games as a kid and that was, that was interesting. I, I don't know anything about baseball, so it's going to be really hard to show my passion. However, if I'm chatting with a company that's, you know, working on changing education like Udacity, that is going to be a conversation that I can have for hours. And the passion isn't something I have to show, it's something that's just gonna come through. So take a look at your interests. What do you like to read about? What do you like to browse online? Um, maybe social media is your passion and you're obsessed with culture and Instagram. You know, What is the future of that in the role and what role can you play in making that future better? That's how you need to think about it. If you can tie your skill set to the problems in that industry that you're interested in and talk about the long-term success and development of that industry, you're gonna be on the right path to really showcasing your passion. 
All right, our second question, I'm gonna to jump to Nathaniel. Can you give some advice on how to find out who the hiring manager is for a certain position for the purpose of following up on an application? I've heard advice such as, such as searching LinkedIn for people at the company, asking connections that work there to look it up, or even calling the front desk to ask. I've tried all those techniques and they rarely work, especially for large companies. This is a great question, Nathaniel. So there's a lot of different, there, there's a lot going on when it comes to how to get to the decision maker. And I definitely think it's important to get closer and closer and closer to the decision maker. That's just basic sales. The worst thing to do would, it would be to, the worst thing to do would be to only apply via job boards on LinkedIn, Indeed, and things like that. Because you have the job board, the filter through the job board, any sort of resume screens that they have, any sort of reviewer screen that they have, then a manager screen, a hiring manager screen, and so on. There's potentially you know six or seven layers between you and the person that makes a decision. This is a, a far cry from when my grandpa first came to the United States, uh, grabbed a bag of tools, went up to a construction site, and said, do you need help building this wall? That's direct to the, the person that can give him the job, right? He went to maybe four or five different construction sites, got the job, eventually became foreman, and the rest is history. But in our digital world, with all these promises from these websites saying, we're going to get you the job, and then, of course, they never deliver to the degree that we wish they would, there's a number of different things that you can try to do. One thing in particular is that LinkedIn does sometimes have like who the hiring manager is in the listing. Maybe that's a premium feature. It might be a general feature. I'm not entirely sure, but I've seen that. Now, the issue is if you apply and then you reach out to them, there might be a lot of people reaching out to them, but there might not. So it probably wouldn't hurt to reach out to that person who they list as the contact for that role. The other thing to do is getting to the hiring manager, while that's important, uh, we don't always know who the hiring manager is. So you can spend lots and lots of time trying to navigate in like a salesman, but the thing is, none of us are salespeople. We're developers, coders, marketers, things like that. Now, it's a good skill set to have, and if you wanna build it 100%, go for it. But there's other things that you can do too. Just getting a referral from someone within the company typically puts you high on the list um, for consideration by the eventual hiring manager. So you might not need to get to the number one decision maker. That might come after they review your application and invite you in for an interview. But what you can do is just reach out to four or five people who work in the job title that you wish you had at that company and talk to them. See what their team is like. See what it's like to work there. And then say, hey, are you... Uh, if, if there's ever an opportunity uh, where your team is growing, would you mind pass, passing along my resume? And then they can pass you along. And so what you do is you create alert on LinkedIn. When roles pop up, you reach back out. And you've already had conversations before, so it's much easier to get through the door. Uh, just to go through some of the ones that you've brought up here. I've heard, I've heard advice such as searching LinkedIn for people at the company. All right, so that's the one that I that I just recommended. And you said that these things aren't quite working. My question would be, what types of messages are you sending out? Is your first message that you've sent out, hey, I'm looking for a job, Does and, and just go look up the last five messages you sent. Did they start with the word I or my? A lot of times the first message we ever send a stranger is, hi, my name is Martin, I want this job, can you give it to me? And the problem with that is that they don't know who you are. So they're gonna say, I don't care. I don't know who you are. No, I can't help you, right? So we need to build rapport with people before we ask. Um, there's actually a book out there called, I think it's a Jab Jab Right Hook or something like that. And it's about giving before you get. And so if you haven't had any conversations with people and you're just immediately going into saying, give me a job, I'm sure a lot of us are out there doing it and not getting very good results. So take a look, audit the messages you're sending out and see where you can make it more about them and less about you, more about trying to learn and ask advice 
rather than asking for them to do something for you. Because honestly, we, we haven't always earned the right for someone to do something for us. Um, a lot of people will do it out of the you know kindness of their own heart, but it's much easier to get someone on the phone and talk to them and then ask them for a referral than to get a referral without any sort of rapport or conversation. Another one you have listed here is calling the front desk to ask. Yeah, that's a hard one. It's, it's a tough one because a lot of people work remote these days. And however, I will say there was someone who applied for a job once and they came into the office. Uh, and uh, I am not in, the, in California, so that I, of course, couldn't meet with them. But I personally liked the initiative. So I did have a call with them. It ended up not being a fit, but it was, uh, you know, it got them to the interview. I don't necessarily recommend that as your baseline strategy. Uh, and calling the front desk probably won't get you to where you need to be because most people use Slack and email nowadays and they don't like to be on the phone. I would say it's probably better to reach out to people directly and try and set up coffees or Skype calls uh, rather than get in through the front desk. But hey, there are a million different strategies that work. It's just about your execution. That's really what we need to focus on. Any of these things could work if executed correctly. And the way that you execute is you make it more about them than about you. I mean, we've had those things where someone pretended they were delivering donuts to an office and in the donut box was a bunch of resumes or something like that and donuts. Now, don't, don't skimp on the donuts. That'll make people mad. But it, it got them in the door. They said, I have donuts for this person. They walked straight into the CEO's office. I, I believe that was the story that I heard. And then, um, I think I touched on all of them, asking connections, yeah. All right, so I think I touched on all the questions with that one, Nathaniel. Thank you so much for your question. And let me know if uh, there's any add-ons to that or any other questions you have. We'll, we'll try and get to them today. Okay, our next question. How should you answer the question, or not really a question, but the statement, tell me about yourself? Uh, we've actually had two people ask this question, I believe. Um, so thank you so much for the question. Tell me about yourself. This is the most broad question and it's how I start every single one of my career calls. Just to listen to people ramble and rant and twist themselves into a pretzel trying to come up with an answer. And I'm not gonna lie, I sometimes even struggle with it when I'm caught off guard. Um, when you're trying to answer the question of tell me about yourself, you have to realize what they're actually asking. They're not asking, tell me who you are in your soul or tell me everything about you from your education to today. They're asking, why are we talking? Why are you and I chatting today? Like, what are we doing here? What's the purpose of this conversation? Now, of course, this can be interpreted a million different ways and everyone might have their own interpretation in their head of what they wanna hear. But if you try and think about it from the perspective of they would like to know what is going to be the purpose of this conversation, what is going to be the direction of this conversation, this will almost always be the first question you're asked. So you get to set the direction and the tone. They're basically looking at you and saying, set us on course. So when you answer this question, probably the best thing to do is lead with something along the lines of, um, my name is, um, and, and this is actually how I used to break it down when I would do personal brand um, coaching. The f if you've ever heard of the why, how, what method, this is why I do what I do, it's by Simon Sinek. This is why I do what I do, this is how I do what I do, and this is what it looks like for you. So personally, I want to reduce people's anxiety and help them get jobs. I do this through coaching, content, and uh, all sorts of other marketing and coaching tactics. And so I do that through coaching, and then how I do it is through marketing campaigns, YouTube lives, um, any other sort of one-on-ones, things like that. So when you break it down, it's 
um, you know, this is what I believe in. This is how I execute that belief. And this is uh, how, how you see it. So I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, which we all do when we're asked this question. But the idea here is you want to keep it concise. Say, you know, I'm, I'm a developer. I, I, I'm really someone who believes in uh, beautiful design. So I learned front end programming in order to help companies develop websites that people want to land on. There you go. I'm a programmer who's really interested in design. I create websites for companies that want to have a beautiful place for people to land on and interact with their brand. That is one way to answer that question if that's what makes sense to you. Or you could say, um, I believe in efficiency and I'm a programmer who's really focused on efficiency. And so I create websites that are not clunky, that are streamlined, that it's very easy to find what you need. And I do that through my uh, organizational skills. So I'm really excited to chat with you today about the things that are going on at your company and how I can help organize your information so that you have the best customer experience. I'm just kind of spitballing a few ideas of how these answers could look for you uh, so that you can figure out how to make it work for yourself. And um, if you wanna you know, give it a shot, maybe write your little pitch, your why, how, what uh, in the comments, please do and, and we can critique it together and possibly even share it later in future videos or on LinkedIn or, or, or Slack or somewhere. All right. I'm going to jump to Ryan's question here. How do you approach the question, why is your current job not a development job related to the position you are applying to? I really appreciate this question, Ryan. I uh, wish I had a little bit more information of what industry you're coming from. But the key thing here is to remember that your past experience always informs your future work. So, for instance, I was working with someone recently whose background is in mental health and therapy and things like that. And so they've moved into programming and what the commonality between the two uh, parts of their lives, their career work life, the commonality between the two sides of their work lives is that back when they were doing therapy, they worked really hard with people in order to change behavior. So just getting someone to get up out of bed in the morning was a, a real feat because they worked in you know the mental health world. And so they, but they saw over time by change, by slightly tweaking little behaviors, you could change someone's day. You could change someone's experience of life. And this was really interesting in the human mind in the, in the mental health world, but they also saw that they had a real passion and a real interest in computers. They would build computers in their spare time. And they saw a lot of similarities between shaping human behavior through therapy and mental health and shaping human behavior through design, development, programming. If you create a program that streamlines someone's taxes or streamlines someone's habit formation or streamlines someone's ability to journal, whatever the thing might be, you can, ease, you can help them make better choices and make better decisions in their life. And so that was the sort of switch that they made. You know, one thing that they might wanna look at in the future is all these different mental health apps, all these different meditation apps, all these mindfulness apps that are coming out. How can they get into that field? Because they have this background in therapy tied in with their programming work to help improve people's mental health at scale. So these are the kinds of things that you can start thinking about of what from my past relates to what I'm currently doing and what I wish to do in the future. And I'm sure you'll be able to find at least one thing that ties all the experiences together because it's all you and you are a cohesive person. So you're a, you're a, you're a single entity trying to accomplish all these things. So it's all coming from the same brain. There's usually a line that you can find that connects it all. All right, our next question. All right, Pedro, 
What if you don't have an experience to talk about in order to back up the answer to your behavioral interview question? I'm currently in SWE, for example. To answer the question, tell me about a time that you had to motivate a team. How do I have an, or I do have an experience, but what if I didn't and someone asked me that question? I love this question, Pedro. Hmm. This one has, there's the simple answer, which I'm gonna jump into, and then there's one that's more complex, which like, there may come a time. Let's, let's start with the complex one. There may come a time in an interview where they ask you about something that you've never done. And our instinct is going to be to freak out. <laughs> We're gonna be like, I don't have experience in that, I'm never gonna get the job, right? We can calm ourselves down because not everyone has every experience, but there are ways to answer questions that are comforting and there are ways to answer questions that are deflating. So I've had people that I've worked with who when they are confronted with like, hey, have you ever worked with this software? Their answer is no. Well, how are you gonna pick up steam in that conversation after giving that kind of an answer? It's gonna be pretty hard. What you need to do is say, I haven't worked with that yet. Keyword yet because everything is an evolution of what you're doing today into the future. And you could say, I appreciate you bringing that to my attention because I'm looking for new things to learn and add to my list. What I have learned are these programs and here's how I've learned these programs. And I'll take that same learning approach to learning this, uh, this new thing that has been brought to my attention. And you can even ask them like, how often do you use it and what do you use it for? And, and what do people typically struggle with when they're trying to learn that programming language? Now you're having a conversation about how to learn that thing, how to gain experience in that thing, rather than just not, rather than just saying I don't have experience. So when it comes to something like, uh, oh, I lost the question here, sorry. Uh, tell me about a time you had to motivate a team. Well, if you've never been on a, been like the head of a team, have you motivated a team from inside? Or have you been on a sports team and been a motivator? Have you done volunteer work and had to motivate people? Have you motivated people in your own personal life in other ways? Uh, maybe you have a bunch of siblings and you had to like get everyone uh, together to go on a trip and like decide where to go. There's a lot of different things that you could potentially talk about that include that idea of motivation. Um, Maybe you organized the, maybe you organized the fantasy football league at your office or something along those lines. Uh, you know, I could use the example of in my first job, I had to organize a, a 5K that we ran as an office and develop the T-shirts and get everyone on board and things like that. So there's a number of different ways that you can answer that question. I would say open your mind a little bit beyond the the narrow view set of this job title and thinking everything has to be perfectly related and say, I can motivate people. I likely have motivated people. What are some examples from my life that I can draw from? Uh, a good example of this is in my personal life, I, I had a little networking group that I ran. Now that's not technically work. Like I'm not getting paid for it back in the day years ago, but the examples that I can pull from that are quite strong, quite good examples of getting people together, trying to promote an event, trying to collect uh, emails and share things out and all that stuff, organizing the discussion. Those are all different things that are not technically my job, but something that I have done on my in my spare time. So for you, what would that be? Um, again, it could be fantasy football, it could be any number of things. Uh, maybe you run a flag football team, who knows? Uh, so yeah, uh, those are a few ideas. Maybe you're a big party planner in your group of friends. That's a, that's a good question. When you look at your group of friends, what role are you? Are you the party planner? Are you like the organizer? Are you the, the person who's just like brings life and, and conversation into the group? Um, I know that there's these like escape rooms that exist and sometimes the escape room, depending on the company you're working with, will watch everyone in the room as they're trying to you know, unlock all the locks and everything and give uh, 
little like personality types to everyone. Like you're the, you're the connector, you're the organizer, you're the blah, blah, blah. And so there's little fun things and maybe go to www.16personalities.com to take a quick personality test and just sort of get an idea of where your skills lie, where you're best and where you maybe have strengths and weaknesses and things like that. All right, Lonnie, got your question here. What exactly should we ask these hiring managers? Wouldn't some questions seem unprofessional, i.e. jumping the gun? Hmm. I'm curious to know, Lonnie, what questions you think are jumping the gun? Um, maybe it was something I said earlier, or maybe it's something that you, you've got in your head. Um, please share them in the, in the chat. Maybe we can add a little more context to this so I can make sure I answer it fully. But what exactly should we ask hiring managers? There's two, two parts to this question. The first part is I think that when you're talking to a hiring manager and you're answering their questions, this is in an interview setting. It's really good to get to a point. It's really good to get to a point where you're having a conversation rather than doing question, answer, stop. Question, answer, stop. Question, answer, stop. Uh, there's actually an example of this. I was years ago talking with my little brother and he was, uh, you know, trying to chat with people on a dating app. And he, he's like, the conversation doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And I looked at the conversation and it's like, what's your favorite color? Stop. Blue, nothing. What's your favorite food? Uh, pizza, nothing. And like the, co the topic just kept changing. So there was no flow to the conversation. And so when you're in an interview, it's kind of a weird analogy, but when you're in an interview, try and make try and build some rapport. And you might have to practice this with friends and, and networking connections prior to getting to the interview. But one thing you can do is say like, if they say, what are some of your strengths and weaknesses? Like, let's say they ask you, what is your weakness, your biggest weakness? You give your answer. And then at the end of your answer, you say, um, you know, how have you seen others handle this same weakness within the company? Are there learning systems put into place? Are there manager check-ins? Are there peer reviews? Like, what are some of the things that uh, you've seen internally that help people deal with this type of skill set? And you might learn that they have, you know, a, a very complex review system put into place to help people grow and overcome challenges and things like that. So when you're asking questions, you should make it more about you know, learning about the company, learning about the culture, the position. And when you get to the end of the interview, I would recommend going to the muse.com or any of these websites that are career focused and just looking up good questions to ask during an informational in, or during an interview, during a behavioral interview. Uh, because some of the things that you can ask is, you know, what skill do you think someone who would succeed in this role like what would be the core skill that someone who would be a success in this role would have? Or you could ask the previous person who had this role, what do you think made them successful? What do you think they could have worked on? Um, these are the types of things, things that reflect back to you stuff you need to know about that position. And also if you say, you know, tell me something that would make someone successful for this role. And they say, oh, someone who's extremely organized, you can, then launch into, oh, there's that's awesome because I've been uh, developing my organization skills over the last six months and you know using these apps. Do you guys use any of these apps? And now you have a conversation going. Oh yeah, we use Slack, we use Monday, we use whatever the thing might be to organize conversations. Oh, that's really cool. I have experience with those programs. Um, and then you'd be like, you know, we, we have a little gift page and blah, 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 and you can make it a little more personal, you know? So these are the kinds of things that I would say you wanna ask questions that are trying to get their opinions. Rather than just saying like, how many people work at the company? You can look that up online. Or, you know, what is the salary? Uh, you know, that's probably a good question, but it's also more of a discussion rather than a, a solid answer. I would start by asking more opinion-based questions. Like, where do you think the industry is going in the next five years? Uh, what about your role do you feel contributes? Like, what about your role do you feel is like, 
the biggest contribution you're having to the company? Like, where do you feel most successful in the work that you do? Make them feel good about themselves. Make them think about, yeah, we are, we're like really doing some good stuff. I'm excited to have you on the team to continue building these things. So those are the kinds of things that you want to think about when you're trying to do that. Mm, okay, uh, Nathaniel, part two of your question. Um, the company that I am applied to has five teams with a certain role open. How do I figure out who to send a follow-up email to one week after applying when I haven't heard a response yet? It's a great question. It's great that you're thinking about following up and trying to stay on top of things. Um, I would say, going back to our previous uh, discussion, reach out to people who have the same job title that you just applied to. If you talk to one person who has the same job title that you just applied to, you can ask them, do you know who the hiring manager is and would you be open to me reaching out to them? Or if you don't feel like, if you feel like that's too intrusive, you could say, is there anyone else at the company you'd recommend that I talk to? And they'll pass you along most likely to someone closer to the hiring manager or the hiring manager themselves. So I would say that's probably the way in. That's probably the way salespeople do it too. They reach out to a random person at the company to try and get any sort of conversation going within the walls. Then they ask that person who else would be good to talk to and that person bounces them around. And maybe you've talked to three or four people before you get to the right person, but that's probably the best strategy. So reach out to 10 people who work there, five people who work there, whatever you're most comfortable with, get one conversation out of the five or 10, and then use that to sort of pinball around until you can find the right person. I would say that's probably the best approach if you wanna go that hard towards that role. But I also think that you should, you know, allow a little bit of, um, well, no, I think that's a good way to start. Let's just start with that. Is it okay to walk in the interview with my laptop to show my personal project slash accomplishments or would managers take it as hijacking the interview? Hmm. Uh, this is Iagam Amini. I'm sorry, I'm terrible at pronouncing names. Uh, please correct me <laughs> in the chat. Uh, but is it okay to walk in the interview with my laptop and show it? I think it depends on how you do it. One thing that's good is to have all the resources you may need to reference with you when you get to the interview. So if you have a little briefcase or a bag or something like that, just have it ready to go. Maybe an iPad, who knows what it is. I know in the creative field, having a portfolio was very important. People would walk in with these big you know, portfolios and put them down on the table and walk through their work. Um, and I know, you know, back when I was applying for my first job back in 2010, that was starting to shift to online. So people were coming in with their laptops and then that switched to iPads and maybe even your phone if you're, <laughs> you don't want to carry all that stuff around. I think it's good to have, I haven't really heard that, heard about situations like that coming up very often. So my question is, have you run into a situation in an interview where you wish you had your laptop? And if that is the case, um, then start bringing it to interviews. If you haven't had that experience yet, and this is more of an assumption, uh, what I would say you definitely don't wanna do is you don't wanna walk in and the first thing you do is plop a, uh, a laptop down on the table and start walking through stuff. You wanna have a good rapport going. You wanna start the conversation, start the behavioral interview, get into the, the, the meat of it. And then if it comes up in conversation or if you wanna push in that direction, say, uh, and they're like, hey, can you, can you show me a time that you've used a certain type of programming language? You could say, yeah, absolutely. Um, there was this you know, project I was working on. It was about sorting movie titles or something like that. Uh, I actually could pull it up if you'd like to take a look at it and we can look at it together. And then they have the option to say yes or no. And that way you're not intruding, you're offering more context. 
So I would say it depends more about how you bring it up than having the laptop in your bag. Uh, don't come running in the room with the laptop already open and forego all pleasantries. So that would be uh, that would be my best answer to that. If you have more context, of course, please put it in the chat and we can try and add a little bit more. All right, Heggy, thank you for your questions. Are there any new features on LinkedIn that are useful but currently underutilized by people? Absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna pull up LinkedIn real quick so I can take a look here of some of the things. The first thing on LinkedIn that is most underutilized by people is the articles and posting uh, features. So a while back, LinkedIn purchased Pulse I believe it was called Pulse, and they integrated it into their website. So you can write articles similar to Medium, where you, you know, it's long form, you can put videos in it, and those articles stay at the forefront of your profile and give you a lot of SEO and clout and different things like that. So it's very good if you're creating content on Medium or a blog or elsewhere to also post it on LinkedIn. It never hurts to add it there. Number two, posting on LinkedIn and sharing posts and videos and things like that. In the past 10 days, and maybe some of you have been seeing this, I've been blowing up your feed. My goal has been to post at least one, excuse me, my goal has been to post at least one unique post every day. And last I looked at my numbers, I think I shot up 300% in profile views in the past 10 days. That's pretty crazy. That's that's pretty crazy for, you know, just a little bit of content each day. Um, so if you're not utilizing the uh, posting feature, pictures, audio, or sorry, pictures, video, and just writing and sharing images and stuff like that, you're going to uh, not show up. You're not gonna be top of mind with people. So I would recommend doing that. Um, if not every day, although that's definitely the best way to go, at least on a, on a weekly basis while you're job searching so that people remember that you exist. You don't want to just disappear into, um, the ether, let's say. So those are two posting features that allow you to get visibility. Another thing you can do is just comment on other people's stuff because that shows up in your activity too. Like, comment, interact with what's happening on LinkedIn. It keeps you top of mind. Other things that you wanna make sure you have is a complete profile, um, contact information. The skills section is very important for SEO. So if you can fill that out with all the skills that you know companies are looking for, when people are looking for to, to hire, they're typing in keywords. And if those keywords aren't on your profile, you're not gonna be found. So make sure you're adding those keywords to your profile. Uh, LinkedIn learning, I think is a really cool thing. I'm not sure how much additional I don't know, boost you get from LinkedIn learning, but if you're just looking to learn, not a bad place to go. And then the final thing I wanna mention is underneath the search bar, when you click on it, almost all of us start in the jobs, searching for jobs. We, job, we type in the job title and we go straight to the job listings. There are two other ways to search LinkedIn. The first one is people. The second one is jobs. Sorry, there's three ways to search LinkedIn. The first one is people, the second one is jobs, and the third one is content. Now the content one, I've not, di I've not gone too deep into, but I'm going to be in the next year because I have a feeling it's going to be a you know, treasure trove of information and unique, interesting ideas. The jobs one is the one that we all know, and the people one, I've created a number of videos so far. If you go to uh, YouTube and you look up the reverse job search on my page, um, it'll walk through how to do a people search and find networking connections. So I really think the people one is probably the thing I use the most. Jobs the second, content third, all the content's moving up. And uh, yeah, try and utilize the search features more. And I did read an article recently, the last thing I'll say is hashtags. A lot of people are using hashtags to research companies. So if you're really interested in artificial intelligence, follow the artificial intelligence hashtag, and you might find lots of smaller businesses 
that wouldn't normally pop up in your search results um, who have less competition for jobs. So definitely give that a sh give that a whirl, give that a shot. Thoughts about, all right, Hudson, thank you for your question. Thoughts about reaching out to companies without relevant current job openings. For example, I have a list of companies I'm interested in. Should I send an introductory letter explaining why I like the company and a hypothetical role where I can add value? Awesome question, Hudson. And this is gonna be one where we revisit some of the things that we've been saying uh, throughout the call. It's not about you at the end of the day. So 100%, if you have a list of companies that you wanna be reaching out to, you should be reaching out to them. But you shouldn't be reaching out to the company generally. You should be reaching out to individuals, which is what you'd have to do anyway. But you're not going to send it to hello at company.com. You're going to be reaching out to individuals who work at that company. And rather than saying, here's who I am, and here's what I like about the company, and here's the role that I want to do, you can say, what is it? You know, while I was doing research on your company, because I find it to be a really interesting industry, a really interesting company doing interesting things, your name came up. It looks like you're working on some really cool stuff. I'd love to learn more about it. Then when you're in the conversation with that person, you can say, what are you struggling with? What are you excited about? And they might say, oh, I'm really struggling with this or this or this, or I'm really excited to launch this new project. And you can say, well, if you're struggling with those things, I have a few hours. Um, I could work part-time or contract and just help you out with that project, uh, that new project launch or, or that thing that's really causing you a lot of pain. Now you're providing value within context of their needs rather than asking for something within the context of your own needs. So I hope that helps you with how to reach out, but I love your question. I definitely think you should be reaching out even if jobs aren't listed. Because what that does is it gets you in so that when a job does get listed, you're the first one getting referred to it. Hope that's helpful. All right. Um, Lagom Amin, sorry again, I'm terrible at names. Uh, is it okay to dress more casual for software development interview? Is it okay to dress more casual for software development interviews? Nothing too casual, um, <laughs> i.e., Bazinga T-shirts. <laughs> but is it okay to show up not wearing a dress shirt and tie? This is a fantastic question um, because things have changed so much in the last decade. When I graduated college, you had to wear a suit. Uh, the startup scene hadn't really caught on as much. I'm sure there were some companies that were fine with t-shirts, but um, it was all suits all day. And now, uh, <laughs> I actually, a few years back, I think maybe three years back, I applied for a job and I was flown out to uh, Boston to interview. And all I brought was like, you know, the clothes on my back and my little pad folio. Because uh, I was only going out in the morning coming back that night. And I wore a suit. So all I had with me was a suit. I didn't have any other clothes. I didn't have anything. Uh, it was just a suit for the day. And I showed up and I get to the office and it's a startup. It's a boot camp. It's, it's this, little, uh, this little company. And they were like, what are you doing wearing a suit? And everyone's just in jeans and t-shirts, what I'm wearing basically right now. And I'm like, you know, I just wanted to make a good impression, something along those lines. And they go, Ah, that's funny. Um, and, the, and they were all super nice about it, but they were giving me little jabs. They were like, uh, you know, you don't have to wear a suit, take that tie off and stuff. And I told this story, I was like, well, you know, whenever I go to a wedding, my brothers and I have a pact that as long as there's a camera around, uh, we are going to stay suited up, ties fully suited up. Um, <laughs> ties done, fully suited up. And so, <laughs> Uh, I made that joke and we kind of laughed about it. Like, you know, oh, you're at a wedding, like everyone else is in, you know, their undershirts and like sweaty and we're all just like perfectly trim. And uh, that was a funny little joke. And then throughout the day, they kept saying, come on, undo that tie, undo that tie. And I was like, no. And I would always make it a little tighter every time they said it. Uh, and it was just, it was a fun little dynamic. So again, if like you mess up as I quote unquote messed up wearing the wrong clothes, you can still make it 
interesting, make it fun, make it a story. And I ended up getting that job, so it was really good. But what I find funny about the whole like how to dress for things um, is that it, it's, it varies so much. And this is why you need to talk to people at the company. This is why you need to network before you go in for an interview. So that you can say like, how do people typically dress here? And I would say the rule of thumb is dress slightly better than what their baseline uh, company dress code is. So if it's uh, you know t-shirt and hoodie, show up in a button down. If it's button down, show up in a blazer. If it's blazer, show up in a suit. You know, just take it a step higher uh, than whatever they're doing in, in the company. Take it a step higher than whatever they're doing in the company. All right, we got about five minutes left. I'm gonna try and grab a couple more questions here. Are there different, uh, all right, Ryan, Ryan's question. Um, are there different strategies for the job search depending on my personal timeline, especially for shorter one to two month search timelines? especially for shorter one to two month search timelines. So I, I assume what you're saying with this question is that you need a job in the next one to two months. Rather than saying, I want a job that's one to two months long. Okay, so if you need a job in the next one to two months, uh, is it different? I think it's just more intense. Like you need to be on it every day, like all day as much as possible, depending on your situation. Like, do you have a job right now? Are you gonna run out of money? What What is the situation that's putting you on a one to two month timeline? There are certain things I wouldn't do if you're on a one to two month timeline. So, you know, I've given recommendations in the past of go start a podcast in order to network. That's a long term, you know, creative, strategic way to build your career, but it's not exactly the fastest way to get to the next job that you wanna to get to. I don't think you can really avoid networking, setting up one-on-one -on -one coffees. I think no matter where you are in your job search, you have to be doing that. It's just, are you doing four coffees a day or a couple a week, right? Um, there was a point where I was pretty desperate for a job. I was about five months into a job search, um, I don't know, in 2013 or something like that. And I was getting pretty desperate. So I was going on three, four coffees a day as many times as I could. I had nothing else going on. So the fact that I wasn't going on coffees for the you know five months prior um, was, a, was a big mistake on my part. So what you needed to do, what I needed to do was really increase the number of people I was talking with. Um, I needed to increase my, my like strategic, approach to those conversations to make it more about like, hey, can I get a referral, you know, at the end of the day? Um, what other things? I mean, getting a job in one to two months, you're going to have to go into sales mode. You're going to have to start really getting specific about the companies you want to work for and, and the solutions that you're bringing them. So, probably the best thing to do if you really need a job in the next one to two months is target startups and reach out to the founders because they're not going to be, they're going to be easier to reach than hiring managers at, uh, you know, a fortune 400 company. So what you need to do is say like, okay, I can do whatever I, I'm going to do whatever I can to get a job at this company. We have an example of an old student who she was a programmer but she just wanted to work this company so bad that she emailed them and said, I'll do anything you need and I can start for free. Uh, she, she's like, I'll do a, an internship, an unpaid internship for a month if you uh, let me come on and I'll just do anything you need. And she eventually worked that unpaid internship into a full-time program, sorry. She worked that unpaid internship into a full-time programming job. It just took a few months um, but she needed to get the experience and get working and get a foot in the door first. So there are different things that you can do to really speed things up, but I would actually recommend doing those things regardless of your timeline. Because your goal here is to help people. The more people you help, the closer you'll get to being able to get paid to help people. And I think that's really uh, the approach and the mindset that we need to have in our head at the end of the day. 
All right, we've come to the end of the hour. I'm sorry we didn't get to every single question, um, but thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts and sharing your questions uh, throughout today's Ask a Career Coach. I'm really excited to uh, jump into uh, next week and uh, do this again with you all. I'll be cutting up this video and these questions and sharing them on my profile throughout the week as well. So if you wanna follow along there, uh, but definitely check out Udacity's career resources um, go to the website and just check out our careers page and uh, fill out the survey that Rui will be putting in the chat to let us know how we can improve these in the future. And if you have more questions, you can reach out to us anytime on Slack, LinkedIn, or any of the other channels that you know we're at. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Please RSVP for next week. And I look forward to helping you and helping answer all of your career questions in the future. Cheers. <laughs>